how do we interpret the world around us? Do we really trust what we see? In this series, experience visual and audio illusions, sensory puzzles and brain tricks from the worlds of art, science, nature and psychology, and learn why they baffle our senses. Let's explore how our mind works. Usually you feel sad when you get into a fight with a friend, nervous before a big test or interview, and happy when you win at a contest or see a long lost friend. In your mind, you might think you are in control of what you feel because you understand the causes of those feelings. But a lot more goes on inside your brain. Your brain and its complex process actually manipulate your emotions. So there is more behind that feeling of anger, nervousness, or glee. Your brain affects how you feel and respond to those feelings in ways you might not even be aware of. How exactly does the brain do that? We might consider emotions internal states, but psychologists say emotions are a combination of cognitions feelings and actions. So what we think of as emotions does not only describe how we feel, but how we process and respond to these certain feelings. To better understand this, let us consider the purpose of emotions. Back in 1872, Charles Darwin published The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Here, he established that emotions are part of a significant evolutionary purpose. For a species to continue, it has to survive and reproduce and pass on its genetic information to its offspring. Emotions such as fear can keep one from harm to survive and eventually reproduce. Because of this, the brain evaluates a stimulus, for example, if an animal is going to attack you or if a potential criminal is about to assault you. Then the brain comes up with a plan on how to best deal with the situation. It does so by using emotions as something that will convince the rest of your body to follow through. The brain is quite a complex network that processes a ton of information every second. Part of the process includes neurons, which are cells that send signals throughout the brain. Neurons send signals to neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that are either released or received by other parts of the brain. These chemicals allow the different parts of the brain to communicate with each other. When there are abnormalities in how the brain receives and processes these chemicals, it can have a big effect on emotions. The main part of the brain responsible for processing emotions is called the limbic system. It is also sometimes referred to as the emotional brain. Since different parts of the brain process different emotions in different ways, if any part of the brain gets injured, it can possibly change your moods and emotions. When you think of a bad memory, it can automatically put you in a bad mood. For example, if you had a traumatic experience of almost drowning in a pool, you might develop a fear around water. So the next time you think you can't control how you feel, think again. The mind has the power to change you for better or worse. It's up to you. Fact. Eating blueberries can actually trigger the growth of new brain cells. Do you have a favorite color? Do you like surrounding yourself with it? Are there colors that make you feel certain emotions or evoke certain thoughts? Is color really that powerful? Color can dramatically influence moods, feelings, and emotions. It can also signal action, shift preferences, and cause psychological reactions. A lot of ancient cultures like the Egyptians and Chinese practice something called chromotherapy. This is the usage of colors to heal. It is also referred to as light therapy or colorology and is used even today as a form of holistic or alternative treatment. The perceptions we have on colors may differ on the individual, but there are a lot of colors that have a universal meaning. Black is the color of authority and power. It is also quite popular in fashion because this color is said to make people look thinner and is also stylish and timeless. You can wear black to almost any occasion. On the other hand, black can also seem overpowering and can make the wearer look aloof or even evil. That is why villains usually wear it. 
White is a symbol of innocence and purity. White reflects light and is also considered a summer color. White is also popular in fashion and in decoration. Doctors and nurses wear white to symbolize sterility or being clean. Red is the most emotionally intense color. It stimulates a faster heartbeat and breathing. Maybe that's why it is also the color of love. During Valentine's Day, you'll find a lot of things that are colored red. Because red is an extreme color, it may not help during negotiations or confrontations. Blue is one of the most popular colors. It brings out the opposite reaction of red. The peaceful and tranquil effect of blue causes the body to produce calming chemicals, so it is an ideal hue for bedrooms. Blue can also sometimes be cold and depressing. Studies have also shown that people are more productive in rooms that are blue. Green symbolizes nature. It is the easiest color on the eye, and it also improves vision. Green is a calming and refreshing color. On TV sets, people who are about to appear on TV are made to wait in green rooms so they can relax. Hospitals also use green to relax patients. Yellow is a sunny and attention-getting color. It is considered an optimistic color, but for some reason, people lose their tempers more often in yellow rooms. Yellow also enhances concentration, which is why it is used in legal pads. Studies have also shown it helps speed up metabolism. Purple is the color of royalty. It symbolizes luxury, wealth, and sophistication. Purple is also considered feminine and romantic. Now that you're aware of this, are you more conscious of the colors around you? Fact, chartreuse, a yellowish green hue, is the most visible color. It's in the middle of the frequencies of visible light. We've understood the effect of colors on mood. What about music? When you listen to your favorite tunes, do you find yourself either happier or sadder? According to scientists at the University of Missouri, listening to upbeat music can quickly boost your mood. In turn, it can lead to a higher probability of socially beneficial behavior, better physical health, higher income, and a greater satisfaction in relationships. Further research shows that people can successfully improve their moods in just two weeks by listening to music. In an experiment, participants were told to listen to upbeat music and their moods improved compared to those who listened to sadder sets of tunes. Other participants who listened to the music without attempting to change their mood did not report an increase in happiness. However, music is not just limited to elevating our mood. Based on a study published in the Journal of Consumer Research, people who go through breakups or are having relationship problems prefer music that reflects their sad mood. In another study, people were presented with different frustrating situations and were asked to rate angry music compared to joyful or relaxing music. The participants liked angry music more when they were frustrated by interpersonal violations, meaning situations that involved other people letting them down compared to impersonal hassles like not getting internet access. Music can also be used as therapy. According to the American Music Therapy Association, clinical and evidence-based uses of music intervention are used to accomplish individualized goals. This has been used for centuries to restore energy, improve mood, or even help the body heal in a more natural way. According to Dr. Frank Lippmann, a pioneer in integrative and functional medicine, musical timeouts are a great way to calm the brain and body. It has been shown that soothing rhythms slow down the heart rate and help you breathe easier as well. Listening to music has many great health benefits, but did you know that making your music could also be therapeutic? You don't have to be a popular recording artist or musician to be able to do this. It can be done simply by singing to yourself or chanting. According to a study on yoga, chanting and the word Aum was as effective as implanting a vagus nerve stimulator. A vagus nerve stimulator, or VNS, which requires surgery, is beneficial to the treatment of depression and epilepsy. The study showed that both implanting the VNS and chanting Aum resulted to limbic deactivation, which is the opposite of what happens when we are depressed. Another study showed that vocal improvisation or singing sessions relaxes the nervous system. See? So music and singing can actually make life a lot better. Fact. 
children have more sensitive ears than adults. They can also hear a larger variety of sounds. The things we see and the things we hear can affect our emotions, but so can the things we smell. Scent can be a powerful memory trigger. This is because the olfactory nerve is very close to the amygdala, which is the part of the brain connected to emotion and emotional memory. It is also close to the hippocampus, which is associated with overall memory. According to research, when areas of the brain that are connected to memory are damaged, the ability to identify smells is impaired. In order to identify a smell, you have to remember where you smelled it before and then connect it to the visual information you received at that time. Smells will not be able to trigger memories if not for conditioned responses. Since we encounter a lot of new odors during our youth, smells often bring back a lot of childhood memories. Smells do not only bring back memories, they can also influence moods and affect your performance at work. Here are some scents that can affect your productivity and mood. Lemons promote concentration and has calming and clarifying properties. This helps a lot when you are angry or anxious. Lemon also has antiviral or antibacterial properties, so it can help boost the body's immune system and improve circulation. Lavender has calming properties that can help control emotional stress. It has a soothing effect on nerves and can relieve nervous tension and depression. It can also help treat headaches and migraines. Another scent with a calming effect is jasmine. It is also used as an antidepressant because of its uplifting capabilities that produce confidence, optimism, and revitalized energy. Rosemary is something you may have heard as an ingredient. While it also does bring a pleasant mood because of what it adds to meals, it also has stimulating properties that fight physical exhaustion, headaches, and mental fatigue. Cinnamon is another scent with stimulating properties. It also helps fight mental fatigue and improves concentration and focus. Peppermint is a scent that is useful when brainstorming. It is an energy booster that invigorates the mind, promotes concentration, and stimulates clear thinking. Studies have shown that inhaling essential oils can activate the hypothalamus, which is the area of the brain that sends messages to other parts of the body. By simply inhaling a certain scent, you already can trigger many changes in the body. This can include activating the immune system, affecting blood pressure, and stimulating digestion. Now, don't you have a better appreciation of your sense of smell? In fact, it's quite fascinating how a quick whiff can brighten or worsen your day. The effects of smell are different on everyone, though. So be careful triggering others' sense of smell in the wrong way. your nose can actually detect more than 10,000 scents. They say we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Yet, sometimes the mere appearance of something is enough to trigger certain emotions in us. Sometimes it can also bring out something really unpleasant, like fear. To be afraid of something because we know it is a threat is one thing like fear of a snake biting us. It is another thing, however, to have an irrational fear of something. This excessive and irrational fear is called a phobia. A phobia is an intense fear of something that in reality really does not pose any danger. Some common phobias include fear of closed in places, heights, flying insects, snakes, and needles. But phobias can develop from almost anything. Phobias are a result of a traumatic experience and sometimes the object of fear is not always the cause of the phobia. It can just happen to exist at the time the traumatic experience happened. Someone who has a phobia realizes that their fear is unreasonable, but they still can't control their feelings. The mere thought of the object or situation is enough to make them anxious. When they are actually exposed to the thing they fear, the intensity of their terror is automatic and overwhelming. Fear is something that is normal and sometimes helpful to have, especially during dangerous situations. It activates our automatic fight or flight response if we need it. This way, we are able to respond quickly to protect ourselves. Phobias are different from fears, however, and the threat is greatly exaggerated. 
even if there is nothing dangerous about the object or situation. Here are the most common phobias there are. Animal phobias, the most common of which are fear of snakes, spiders, rodents, and dogs. Then there are natural environment phobias, which include fear of heights, storms, water, and the dark. There are also situational phobias, or fears triggered by a specific situation. These include fear of open spaces, flying, driving, tunnels, and bridges. Lastly, there are blood injection injury phobias. These include fear of blood, injury, needles, or other medical procedures. Some signs and symptoms that you have a phobia are difficulty breathing, feeling dizzy, a racing heart, chest pains, trembling or shaking, a churning stomach, hot or cold flashes, tingling sensations, or sweating. The emotional signs of a phobia are a feeling of overwhelming anxiety or panic, fear of losing control or going crazy, an intense need to escape, feeling like you're going to die or pass out, feeling unreal or detached from yourself, and knowing that you're overreacting but still feeling powerless to control your fear. The best solution is to see a psychiatrist. Fact, our long-term memory closes when we sleep. For some reason, we cannot remember most of our dreams as soon as we wake up. Have you ever heard of the phrase gut feel? It's a weird feeling you have inside you, or that little voice in your head, as some say, that tells you something with no basis. Deep inside, though, it's something you just know is true. According to researchers, intuition is more material than it seems. A social psychologist named David Myers said that the intuition our right brain has always reads our surroundings, even when our conscious left brain is busy. This way, the body can register these pieces of information while the conscious mind remains unaware of what is happening. Another theory says that you can feel approaching events thanks to your dopamine neurons. Apparently, jitters of dopamine help us keep track of reality by alerting us to subtle patterns we don't detect consciously. Researchers say it's a matter of finding a balance between your gut instinct and rational thinking. Once you feel that alert from your gut, you can use your rational mind to weigh your choices and decide on the best way to act on it. Here are some gut feelings that experts recommend that you should pay attention to. First is, something feels wrong in my body. Your body is a powerful communicator. If you have a gut feeling about your body, like if you're weak or something is off, you should listen to it and get checked immediately. Also pay close attention to any sudden physical sensations when you're interacting with someone. For instance, if you feel a burning sensation in your gut when a stranger approaches you, it may mean that person is dangerous. It's better to be safe than sorry. Another gut feeling to look out for is, I'm in danger. Social conditioning helps us create unconscious beliefs, and they can make us produce first impressions and snap decisions that might be wrong sometimes. But again, it's better to be safe than sorry. It's best to check your gut feelings with your rational mind. But if you feel that something is off, run. One more example is, I want to help. This is when you have a sudden pang of sympathy and feel you should assist someone who might need it. This might mean you have read someone's nonverbal signals and have acknowledged that they are in trouble. You'll never know what you can prevent or save, so it's better to check it out. Another gut feel is, this is it. This happens when your intuition tells you that you have found something or that something is truly right for you. Out of all the gut feelings you can have when making decisions, this might be the best one. Following your instincts can lead to choices that can improve the quality of your life. The brain knows a lot more than we think it does, and it has various ways of letting us know it. As long as we are always alert about those signs and use our rational thinking, we can always end up making the right decisions. Fact. The size of your brain at birth is almost the same size as your brain when it becomes an adult. We need motivation in several aspects of our lives, in studying, in work, in dealing with situations and people. 
We sometimes encounter difficulties and tragedies, and these usually make it harder for us to go on. Motivation helps us reach our goals and move forward. There are two types of motivation, positive and negative. Positive motivation is the type of motivation that a person experiences when he or she expects a certain reward. One example is when a child is given toys or ice cream when they get good grades in school. Negative motivation is the type of motivation that uses a punishment to convince someone to accomplish a goal. Given the same situation as a child who needs to get good grades, an example of a negative motivation could be that he or she will not be allowed to watch television if they get low grades. Both forms of motivation can lead to the same results. There are times, though, when negative motivation is necessary. This can be used where there is a possibility for the person to escape not achieving a certain goal. For instance, prison is a negative motivation for people to not commit crimes. The idea of this punishment can discourage people from violating the law. Positive and negative motivation can also be used together. In fact, it is advised that both positive and negative motivation should be used together because people are more motivated that way. Let us take, for example, the case of athletes. Usually, they are surrounded by positive motivation when their fans cheer them on. Sometimes, though, they can be demotivated by hecklers and booers during a game. Positive motivation happens when athletes perform and receive awards for actions they've done. This encourages them to continue what they are doing. They also rely on the self-reinforcement of their coach, loved ones, spectators, and the media. Those MVP awards, medals, recognitions, and the mere applause from fans are examples of positive motivation. Negative motivation happens when the athlete improves in their performance due to fear of not living up to expectations. One possible consequence could be that they get cut from the team. They could also be made to sit on the bench and not play at all which lowers their rank as an athlete. Players who get motivated negatively may show inhibiting behaviors that can turn up during high-pressure situations. Some effects could be indecisiveness during a game, lack of creativity and techniques while playing, fear of taking risks, and susceptibility to choking. Long-term effects could also include a very low self-confidence, lack of initiative, and a lowered belief in oneself. Athletes are just the example in this case, but this is how positive and negative motivation can affect anyone. So remember, it's okay to be a little tough and strict sometimes. Our individual personalities define who we are. Our choices, preferences, dislikes, and quirks make us different from one another. However, Sometimes our brain is more in control of us than we think. There are also times when we are put to situations that make us prefer one thing to another. How we react to situations involves how our brain processes the things that happen to us and what the best way to react is. You can be sure though that your subconscious brain keeps everything.